The coronavirus keeps evolving. As it spreads, it's mutating, taking on new characteristics that can make it harder to fight. New variants found in South Africa and the UK are more contagious, straining health services. This mutation has led to more cases than we've seen ever before. Numbers that, alas, cannot be explained away by the meteoric rise in testing. Japan is trying to isolate a new variant from Brazil. There's no proof any of them are any deadlier, but the virus is constantly changing and could eventually make vaccines less effective. We're watching evolution take place right in front of our eyes. The new coronavirus is doing everything it can to survive, becoming cleverer at jumping from host to host. The hope is that we're doing everything we can to survive. Many big economies are back in lockdown, including South Africa. This isn't a waiting room. It's the treatment room for COVID-19 patients at the hospital in Kaya One patient calls out to tell us she's been sitting and waiting for three days, waiting for a bed to become free next door. These one are too weak to sit on a chair. So we put them on the, on the stretcher. And they are all on oxygen. Dr. Susan Mukonkole has been working here for nine years, but the pandemic is pushing him to his limits. A third of his colleagues here have already had the virus. How do you feel to see your hospital that full? Sometimes you feel powerless because you don't have enough uh, space. Sometimes we don't have enough oxygen point. We need to improvise and see how we can split one point into two to give oxygen. Sometimes you have to choose. To who do you give first the oxygen and who should wait? That, 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 that sometimes is very stressful for this. On average, one person dies with COVID-19 in the hospital every day. There's a small room next door with somewhat better facilities for acute patients waiting for an intensive care bed at another hospital. But the local health minister admits that not everyone can get an ICU bed. Most are already full. If the person qualifies um, for the ICU, it depends. But remember, it, uh, even, even prior COVID, for ICU entry, there's always a scoring index. The house is on fire. South Africans are battling a new, more infectious variant of the virus. The fast spread has led to tighter lockdown measures, including a ban on alcohol sales and the closure of beaches. The police are struggling with enforcing them. Only patients over the age of 45 are now being tested at the state clinics. The demand is overwhelming. Here in virologist Wolfgang Preiser's laboratory, every second test is positive. The peak of the second wave is expected in South Africa in mid-January. But even after that, experts expect further waves. I fear that neither the current enormous surge that we are experiencing now, nor the arrival of a vaccine sometime into halfway through 2021 for a small proportion of the population will be able to make a big difference. The government has said it's already in talks with vaccine manufacturers, but there are no details yet. Emma Hodcroft is a molecular epidemiologist how much hope should we be putting in these vaccines? So the good news is, is that your body learns to recognize many parts of the virus when it's exposed to these vaccines or when you've been infected with SARS-CoV-2. So even if the virus changes a little bit, the hope is your body will still learn to recognize it and be able to mount a really good protective response. However, it's going to take some time to get enough people vaccinated so that we can really see this impact on the number of cases. And it's important to remember that most vaccines need two doses before they're fully effective. So we really need people to keep using other non-pharmaceutical protections like hand washing, mask wearing, and being aware of aerosol transmission until we're certain that the vaccines are helping us to keep the case numbers low. But why all the concern then about these mutations, uh, considering that they're so slight? The, the boss of BioNTech told DW that they're only 1% and, and, and that wouldn't affect his vaccine's effectiveness. So why are we also worried? 
I think one thing that is important to keep in mind is that a lot of the fear about vaccines is hypothetical. Certainly, it's possible that the virus could change enough that your body doesn't recognize it anymore, and then your protection could be impacted. But until we have a reason to believe that some of these mutations are really having that effect on real people who've been vaccinated, I think it's important to keep our worry a little bit in check. Now, certainly, there are some mutations that have some concerns from early studies. But importantly, these have all been done in the lab, and it's very hard to predict what the impact of a lab study actually means in a full-size human and a full-size population. So I think until we really have evidence that these mutations will impact vaccine efficacy, we shouldn't be too worried. What sort of time frame are we looking at? I mean, could it speed up the, uh, the, the rate of its mutations? So luckily, SARS-CoV-2 has a pretty consistent mutation rate. We actually call viruses mutations kind of clock-like because they're so predictable in how often they happen. So we don't expect the virus to mutate faster. But one thing we do want to keep in mind is that while we have high case numbers, we're maximizing the virus's ability to explore different people, different immune systems, and maybe be put under interesting and unique selection pressures. And this might mean that we see a mutation start rising in prominence because it's been in one of these unique situations. We can never completely eliminate that this might happen, but clearly the fewer people that are getting infected, the less room the virus has to play in these different environments, and hopefully the less chance that we see a mutation that we'd really rather not see. And Emma, tell me more about what we know about these mutations making people's antibodies less effective at neutralizing the virus. So there's been a few studies on some of the mutations that are found in both the 501YV1 and 501YV2 variants. Those are the variants predominantly found in the UK and in South Africa. And the news has been mixed here. So what scientists do in these cases is they take the virus and then they expose it to what we call the serum, the antibodies of people who've already had SARS-CoV-2. For some of these mutations, it looks like there isn't any impact on how well those antibodies work. For some of the other mutations, in some cases, it seems like it might reduce the efficacy. But again, these are for single mutations and oftentimes a few people's serum. So we really need to keep doing studies to find out not only how widespread might this effect be, but does this actually mean that it impacts the, your immunity in a full-grown human rather than just in a Petri dish, and whether this is something we really need to be concerned about. Is that why tracing or, or sequencing has become so important? So I do think that one thing that these new variants have really brought to the fore is the importance of genomic surveillance and sequencing. We can only tell that a new variant might be responsible for a rise in cases if we have sequences that tell us that that virus has a different genetic makeup. And importantly, because that virus has this unique kind of fingerprint of mutations, we can track how it's spread around the world as well, which is why we know that this UK and South African variants are in different places around around the world. This is really important, as not only does it mean that we can identify variants and the mutations that might be impacting things like transmission, but we can also understand how the virus is spreading and whether we can protect countries from getting it or how we can contain it once it's there. Now, the number of sequences countries are generating is really different from country to country, and it would be great to see a more concerted effort to make sure that we have regular sequences coming in from every country around the world. Emma Holcroft, molecular epidemiologist, thank you very much for being on the show today. And let's bring in our science correspondent, Derek Williams. He's been looking at your questions surrounding COVID-19. Why are members of the same household not always infected with the coronavirus after one member is infected? This is an aspect of the pandemic that puzzled scientists from the start. You know, it, it kind of makes sense to, to reformulate this question to something like, um, if this is a novel pathogen that no one had ever been exposed to before, then we should have all been equally likely to get it and, and to get it equally bad, right? I mean, especially in a shared space like a household, but we apparently aren't. Um, one possible reason why is that prior exposure to other coronaviruses might possibly lower risks for some people. So their immune systems were maybe a little forearmed. Um, then, of course, 
There are also plenty of people who are asymptomatic, even when they do catch the disease. Uh, they just appear, for all intents and purposes, to be healthy, and they remain undetected, even though they're carrying SARS-CoV-2 and could maybe give it to others. But we should also flip this question and, and look at the other half of the equation, uh, how contagious someone is. So not how come some people don't catch the virus, but instead, why some of us seem to give it more easily to others. Um, there's some scientific consensus that for reasons that remain unclear, a subgroup of people often called uh, super spreaders or super emitters could be driving most of the transmission. Um, some experts think just 10 to 20% of people who catch COVID-19 pass it along to up to 80% of all subsequent cases. So in other words, if your spouse or your child has the virus, but for whatever reason isn't a super spreader, they're less likely to give it to you, especially if you follow isolation protocols. Um, that said, there's broad agreement that during lockdowns, uh, transmission still happens more within homes than anywhere else, simply because sharing a household with someone who has COVID-19 increases your exposure. So statistically, at least, you're still more likely to get it from a family member than you are from a stranger.